Cool. So um, happy to be here. It's really nice to talk uh, to other people. You know, not not a not a opportunity that comes often these days. So I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm Sasha. I work at DeepMind, um, and I mostly work. I started mostly working on hierarchical RL, and this is kind of merging hierarchical RL and multi-agent RL. And this work was with Tony, who was my intern, Maria, who was another intern, Remy, and Joel, who are my colleagues. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is options as responses, which is like a work where we kind of using behavioral hierarchies for multi-agent RL. Um, so let's kind of like, if you have any questions, just jump right in. Um, so I'll, I have enough material, I think, for half hour, but so I'm happy to take questions as we go. Um, and kind of in a, in a little bit different vein from what uh, Leonid was talking about. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I feel like there's that multi-agent RL, apart from presenting problems, it actually presents a lot of opportunities and it's rather a solution to some things. Um, so what I'm really excited about in AI generally is the question of generalization. Like, you know, that DeepMind, our mission is to build AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. Kind of artificial is kind of easy. Um, everything we do is artificial. Intelligence, okay, we can make some intelligent things. Like, I supposedly even ImageNet classifiers are somewhat intelligent. But the generality is really the key thing that humans do have and almost no other intelligence system out there does it's like the key kind of problems like how do you actually make something that is general that solves a lot of problems and prob and also problems that it haven't seen before and in some sense we can think about um if we think about the the modern approach to ai it's something like uh intelligence is like the sparks which come out when data meets compute we like just take a hell of a ton of data throw it onto some deep neural net into like some gpu or uh, tpu and like it just grinds through it and they got some solution um and neural networks are pretty good once the problem is set but the question is like if if that is the picture then where do i get that data that I will throw at some kind of really large neural network in a really big cluster, and out of it comes general intelligence. Like, where do I get those problems that I train on it? Obviously, Atari is not good enough. I don't think anyone believes that if we train on Atari really, really long time, really, really well, we'll get anything that is generally intelligent. Same thing is for any other video game. So the question is, like, where do we actually get the problems on which to train? And in... In some sense, there's like a single agent answer to it. And it's like, well, we'll just keep making a lot of tasks. We'll just design a lot of problems and we'll keep adding to it and adding to it. And one day we will get like enough problems. It will be diverse enough that we'll train something on it. And boom, here comes general general intelligence or some at least general general reinforcement learning method. And the what, what I'm kind of working with here is a, is a multi-agent take on that, which is that these like wide range of problems will come from interactions of multiple agents. Uh, as uh, Leonid mentioned in his um, early in his uh, overview is that, well, the interesting thing about multi-agent is that one's agent, one's agent environment is another agent, right? So whenever I change behavior, everyone else's environment around me has suddenly changed. So uh, on the one hand, it's of course a problem, but on the other hand, this is sort of an opportunity because that allows for generation of a lot of problems uh, without us actually having to do anything. We just take a lot of agents, we throw them into the environment and they'll start just posing a lot of problems to each other, hopefully spiraling up the kind of like this ladder of complexity. And we somewhat seen it in uh, like some of examples of games like Success and Go, right? We've seen that AlphaGo just playing against itself managed to find the parts of the Go kind of game space that humans haven't seen before and it kind of surprised the players. And there were some, so along those lines, there were some things in StarCraft that kind of went that way in the sense that you have to, if you 
any of you read our, our StarCraft paper, you would find that like the main innovation there was this ladder, which was a kind of a, it was a very multi-agent approach to generating new learning problems for the agent to solve so that it can increase its competence. And that's kind of our take here. And, um, but what is the kind of the role of hierarchical reinforcement learning in this context? And why I think it's kind of applicable here is to learn a menu of behaviors to respond to those different problems. And quite often, these different problems are kind of social in the sense that they are behaviors of other agents. Uh, and then to identify those problems and respond with the right behavior and generalize to novel unseen problems. And this is all in context of uh, multi agent hierarchy sometimes. Live streaming is on. Oh, by Dean, sorry, I called you Leonid and I, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you did, but uh, I, I, I guess I got confused. Anyway, thank you. Um, okay, let's go on. So, and we want to generalize to novel unseen problems. And in, the, in this context, usually what I mean by unseen problems would be novel agents, right? Like your social circumstances have changed. You have a new housemate, just moves in. All the problems around the house are now different because that housemate does not behave like your previous housemate did. So, um, okay. Yeah. So, as a running example, I will have this simple game that we came up with, which is uh, a little bit like taking a lot of complexity of StarCraft out, but leaving the essentials in, which we call running with scissors. So, it's kind of grounded in the rock, paper, scissors game, uh, but it's a spatial uh, version of it. So there are two little agents, they run around this little field and they collect um, different resources, which are uh, rocks, papers, and scissors. Uh, and they collect them into their inventories. Um, <clears throat> they only see a little bit of the world. It's partially observable. I think it's like three by four five or by four, something like that. So they have a limited amount of space in front of them that they see. And what happens is that they run around, they pick resources, and then they can, um, either when the time of the episode runs out or if they close enough and they shoot each other, they tag, then they play out their inventories and they um, get the rewards. And when they play out the inventories, it's simply like you take inventory of one, take inventory of the other, you normalize them, and you feed them through the rock, paper, scissors matrix. So it's... Uh, Statistically, it's the same as if we come with those inventories and we play infinite amount of games with those distributions of uh, uh, items, and that will be the outcome. But it's simply just take one inventory, take the other, and multiply it for the matrix. One gets the uh, return of that, the other one gets the negative of that. So it's to model kind of this non-transitivity of rock, paper, scissors, uh, but in a spatial uh, game. Um, and the, so the, the, the interesting things here is like, well, it's zero sum. So only like, what's my gain is your loss. That's concealed information. You do not actually see what the other opponent does. You don't know their inventory. And the reward is non-transitive. So it's in the sense that for every, for every policy, like every set of things that I collect, there is a potential to be winning or losing unless I know my opponent's inventory. I don't know whether I'm doing great or I'm doing terrible. Uh, so even in this example, you can see that sort of the problems from the previous slide are different opponent policies. Maybe I'm playing the opponent that really likes picking rock, or maybe the opponent that really likes picking paper, maybe the opponent that does something else. And uh, I have can have different behaviors to respond to that. I can pick resources, I can attack, I can scout, I can just like try to go and see what resources have been picked up or try to go and see what opponent is literally doing right now. And to generalize in this case is to play against the opponent you haven't seen before. So this would be kind of like a running example uh, through this talk, but we'll talk about more environments later. Uh, so and the very, very gist of it, kind of very high level overview of the agent that I'm going to present, um, which I call we called operate options as responses, is that at the top level, um, the policy kind of over options, like the high, the top level of hierarchy, is trying to estimate some something in the latent representation about what the opponent has, what it does, what it is it doing. It could be something like opponent has rock, and then that kind of 
inference in the latent space kind of picks an option with which to respond. So like it could be picking paper. I'll get into the details of it, but this kind of like a general overview is that I'm trying to, the way I'm factorizing my policy, the way I'm building a hierarchical agent is by saying that at the top, uh, my decisions are something about inferring what's going on with the opponent and then uh, my low level options, my little policies that actually implement uh, into uh, primitive actions, they are kind of responses to that inference. So, uh, so okay, now the like overview of the talk, I will talk about the model and the training, um, hopefully making it clear. And then we'll look at whether Opley, Opley learns uh, and whether it generalizes, because as I said in the beginning, I'm mostly interested in, interested in generalization. Um, yes, Vadim. Uh, can you uh, expand a bit on how that game actually works? So do you have this common phrase that uh, we uh, have commitment to a strategy and we somehow incentivize commitment to a strategy, but how exactly does that, does that work? Sorry, uh, what about commitment to the strategy? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Uh, I, I'm just uh, not, I don't fully understand uh, actually the mechanics of the game. So uh, does it have to collect uh, rock points to then be successful at using rock? Uh, it's a bit like that. So uh, let's like kind of, it has pockets, right? An inventory. So it goes around and when it steps over the square with a particular resource, that item goes into its inventory. Mm -hmm. So let's say the agent pick up, picked up four rocks, one paper and one scissor, right? So that's mm -hmm. its inventory. Now the opponent has picked something up as well, right? Now, either at the end of the episode or when one of them shoots another, they have like a shooting beam that is like a little, little like you can sometimes see this yellow flash in the animation. Okay. Uh, if, they, if that happens, then they essentially, the game stops and they kind of play out their inventories against one another. Okay. And one is that there's this formula here. Let me actually, I think I have a, I have a can I do the, uh, can I, do you see my mouse at all? No, really. Um, I don't. Yeah, wait a sec. I, usually there is this way to, anyway. So you see this formula, right? Of the just be, be, uh, below the animation, right? Yeah. Uh, and essentially, that's how we compute the, re uh, the reward. So uh, V0 is the inventory of the first player, of the zero player, and the V1 is the inventory of the, of the okay, first player. Okay. So we first we normalize them. So essentially, those like five rocks and one paper, one scissors turn into something like 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, right? Like for for the simplicity, something like that. So right? there's, there's no point in like hoarding. There is no point in hoarding, but there's a point in balancing. So yeah. um, uh, kind of you kind of vary your commitment to a particular strategy, um, and then. Well, what you do if once the confrontation happens is that you essentially normal you multiply those normalized inventories through this matrix, one on the left, one on the right, and you get the reward for one agent and minus that for the other. So it's an it's a, like you can see the matrix is like this non-transitive rock paper scissors matrix. So essentially, if I have a lot of rock and you have a lot of paper, then I'll get a negative reward and you'll get a lot of positive reward. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated if we have mixes. So there's like a lot, some, some kind of hedging can go. Like uh, if I have a, a lot of rock and paper, I will kind of get some damage from your, and you have a lot of scissors, I'll get some damage from your scissors, but you also get some damage from my paper. But we can see that this is like expectation over a lot of rock, paper, scissors games yeah. with exactly. this program. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what it is, mathematically speaking. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Is that because that that's kind of it's it's good if we're all on the same page. So, any other questions about the game? Okay. Oh, cool. All right. Cool. So as I said, we'll look at the model. We'll then look at uh, kind of just a bunch of training codes, kind of does it learn, does it generalize to unseen opponents? 
And then we will look at sort of what are actually those sub policies, those options that the agent learned. What are the behaviors do they correspond to? They cover all aspects of behavior. And then we'll look at uh, kind of scaling it up on just two more environments like this. The first part will be mostly with this game, and then we'll look look at a bunch more stuff. And there'll be some things. Uh, yeah, I uh, hope they'll be interesting. Cool. So um, just before we go into the details of uh, the paper uh, of the of the algorithm, the kind of I just want to draw the uh attention to like the hardest bit in kind of hierarchical rl it's always the credit assignment right so whenever you have a policy that's split into high level decisions and the low level decisions there's always a question how do how do you oops sorry wrong button how do you exactly credit assign because at the top you have to give credit for the right choice of an option at the bottom have to give the credit for the right execution of an option or wrong, right? But you only, but what you get is just one thing, just one reward. It's like you either like won or you lost, or maybe you won with this margin or lost with that margin. But there is, it's very hard to disambiguate kind of like what did you did right? Did I, did you think that the opponent was playing rock, uh, but the opponent was actually playing paper and that's where you made a mistake? Or did you actually know that the opponent is playing rock? You just had a very poor response to that. Uh, and what we will do is like to disambiguate that, we will reveal the concealed information in hindsight in the crib. So by Demon, his overview, he talked about sort of decentralized training, centralized execution, like, sorry, decentralized execution, centralized training and all that. This is a similar thing is that, but here instead of, um, since it's not a collaborative environment, all we assume is that in the critic, I can have access to the observations of the opponent. So that's the same thing that um, some of the algorithms like contrafactual uh, multi-agent uh, papers are doing. Also, this is what we did in StarCraft and Capture the Flag games. Like once the episode is done, I can kind of look at what opponent was doing. And this is somewhat similar to what human players do in competitive games like StarCraft once the match is played, you can actually watch the replay with everything revealed and figure all out like your own credit assignment. So this is kind of inspired by this replay watching. Um, so, okay, cool. So now the agent. First, uh, what we will do is we will factorize, I actually want to try to see if I can make a, uh, like a pointer uh, work um, so that I can show the, um, just to a little bit better. Uh, nah. There's usually like a red dot I can conjure. Oh, maybe. Uh, yes. Sweet. Do you see the, the red thing? Perfect. Um, awesome. Um, so what we were going to start with is we're going to represent the value function differently. This is something that we are doing in the critic. We'll represent the value function, and this is going to be actor critic algorithm. So we need a value function uh, for that. So we represent value function as a mixture model where mixture weights are conditioned on the concealed information, but mixture components are conditioned only on the agent observation. It's just simply saying that, like, I will kind of represent my value as some kind of weighting over the possibilities, but I will decide which possibilities come through when I see concealed information. It's a bit like what I can represent here is like, if my opponent has rock, my value is such. If my opponent has paper, my value is such. But notice that we don't kind of tell the agent what should be compressed in the Z, what exactly should we represent here. It's for the learning to decide. So essentially, it compresses into this Q of Z everything that is relevant in X prime, the concealed information, and relevant in terms of representing the value function. Uh, so now what we could do, because we could, in principle, since we have this mixture of values, we can also create a policy that is a mixture, uh, which is the same mixture, but over the policies where eaters uh, will be our um, uh, options and we will reuse the same queues but there's of course a problem here is that to compute those queues I need opponents uh, observation and I can't do that 
uh, in my actor, in my sort of running agent, right? I can, this will be cheated. So, but what I can do, I can build an approximation, right? So I can use, um, I can build a distribution P in my agent that I will kind of pull close with KL divergence term to the, uh, uh, to the distribution in my critic. And I'll use the same options, but then when I act, I will use this distribution. So I essentially can use mu to generate trajectories but then I use pi uh, to learn the options. And I will just use off policy correction, uh, vtrace algorithm to, to do that. So I'll essentially, I, to generate trajectories are on mu, it's all fine, it's all within an agent, no concealed information is used. When I'm training, I'm in the critic looking at pi, uh, I do off policy correction because I know both uh, action distributions perfectly. I can do the off policy correction and train actually that bit. So what does it what does it give me this sort of funny construction? It gives me the ability to split credit assignment. When my choice of my option, this is pi p is my policy over options is wrong. It doesn't match the Q here. Then the KL divergence term will be high and I'll be training my policy over options. But since these guys are different, my off policy correction term will kill any gradient going to my option. So I will not be training options. I will be training policy over them and correcting it. So uh, I will assign credit properly. On the other hand, if policy over option was correct and Q and P match, then there'll be no KL. I will keep my policy over options the same, but uh, I will be training my option. All the gradient will go there. Uh, yeah, credit for option execution. So I think, um, and to learn the value function, to learn this bit, we only use gradient from the value. So gradient from the value trains the queue. So I kind of managed to circumvent the problem of uh, credit assignment in, uh, um, in HRL by essentially saying, oh, actually, where is my camera off? I like being, I like being on screen. Uh, uh, by essentially saying that uh, I will kind of train almost in a supervised way um, of what is my policy over options, and then I'll just approximate it. Cool. I think I got everything hung up when I turned on the camera. Guys, sorry, do you hear me? Do you see me, or did I just disappear? Yeah, all, all fine. Cool. I was just, like, lagging. I think when my camera is on, everything is just lagging. Sorry, I'll have to turn it off. Uh, I'll turn it on once the questions are in. Okay, a lot better. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know why the camera and uh, the uh, presentation doesn't quite work. Um, are there any questions at this point? Well, do I understand correctly that uh, you don't have separate training phases or anything? It is all trained in one uh, standard uh, standard phase, but the formulas are as such uh, that such that uh, it sort of uh, breaks down into credit yeah. for option and credit yeah. for option execution. Yeah, so I do not have to pre-train my sub policies. They will be training as I go. And I don't, and uh, I just like manage to split credit assignment in such a way that they will kind of know when to train the option, when to train the uh, uh, the policy over them. So I don't need a free training phase. And in some sense, uh, that's what I feel is like really the, the kind of ambition in HRL, because you want to be able to learn both things at the same time, so they kind of adjust to each other. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Right. Um, so this is just a bunch of related work. I'm not going to read it all out loud, but uh, this kind of, I just want to highlight a few ideas that are important. One obviously is hierarchical RL and the idea of like options and splitting things apart. Uh, then there's also multi-agent RL, obviously, because we're multi-agent and I'm sort of interested in generalization, things like that. There's also 
The other part is hindsight. So this is something that's speaking, uh, uh, being picked up lately, is using sort of using something that's available after the episode uh, to do credit assignment better. So there's a really nice, uh, uh, nice paper, Coulda, Shoulda, Woulda by uh, Lars Berzing that I really recommend and a bunch of others. So when you essentially, when you have a bit more information after the episode have run, you can you can do some cool stuff. Um, so now let's look let's look a little bit at like sort of does it learn, does it work, does it generalize? Uh, so let's start with a simple sanity check, uh, which is uh, I will just take a bunch of fixed opponents, I will train specialists with pseudo rewards, an agent that picks up all rocks, agent that picks up all paper, agent that picks up all scissors. And train uh, train a bunch of agents just to exploit that. This is not a multi-agent RL problem. This is simply a multi-task RL problem. But we want to run a sanity check and figure out whether this thing works and whether it trains and all that. And uh, sort of as baselines, we use the uh, just the good old A3C, and then something that's uh, kind of like our re-implementation of counterfactual uh, MA policy gradient, essentially. What is that? What that is is that you like the simplest explanation of that is that you run A3C, but you let the critic look at the opponent observation. That's essentially the whole the whole trick with counterfactual uh, uh, multi agent policy gradient. And we see that essentially for that problem, which is a multi kind of multi agent, uh, it's not even multi agent; it's multi task. All the algorithms perform pretty well. They all kind of like not particularly distinguishable for each other. Opera trains a little bit faster, but like converges to a little bit lower, lower performance. But they're all sort of in the in the ballpark. But um, now let's go and look at generalization, and that's what sort of is the most interesting part for me. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna train our agents well uh, in self play. So I will take and makes like six randomly initialized neural networks of Opera, six randomly initialized networks of any of the baselines. And they play in this pool, like just the, the six agents against each other. Uh, and once they played enough, and like that's just uh, an amount of training time, I will test them against those held out specialists. So this is like a question of, all right, you trained in your pool, you looked at your behavior, can you now generalize to new to, to something that you haven't seen, and the intuition why we sort of used specialists, which is these like straightforward huge strategies, is that if the agent actually understands the game, it should be able to play well against those guys, right? If you manage to learn something about this, right? Because they are very straightforward; they just go and pick a lot of a resource. And what we find is actually when we're measuring generalization almost all of the, like the baselines just do not generalize they barely take off they take off like a tiny little bit but there's a huge gap between them and operate which actually does generalize which kind of learns to uh, uh to play against something that it hasn't seen before uh but that's also not the only way we can compare agents right since it's a it's a two-player zero-sum game and i trained a bunch of agents i can just like compare them head to head right i can just uh, I trained them all in self-play, but now I can play each agent from each architecture uh, against everyone else, including themselves, and get like a huge uh, matrix of scores. Uh, okay, yeah. So if we look kind of like, I'll just aggregate the stats from those scores into a few statistics that we can look at. Uh, so one is just a payoff matrix kind of integrated over the agent architectures. And we can see that operate outperforms uh, pretty much all the baselines, just in the head to head. So it just wins most of the games. There's also, here's the another version of operate. I'm not gonna talk about it in this talk, but you can read what it is in the paper. It's just a slightly different, it's kind of an ablative, ablated version. Uh, another thing we looked at is the um, Nash. So you can, look at the um, this matrix of all agents versus all agents and you can ask yourself if i was playing a meta game where i would have to pick every like it's a, again a two-player game and i'm picking a distribute i'm kind of every 
time I'm picking which agent I will play against the player that will also pick another agent from that population and our payoffs are kind of what is in the matrix. So the, the Nash distribution is the kind of like the best way, the distribution of me of picking those agents. So in some sense, if you're in the Nash, uh, an agent is in the Nash, it means it's a good agent because it kind of covers some part of the strategy space. And we can see that almost all Nash weights are an opera agents. Um, another thing we looked at is effective diversity. Um, I don't know, like, I don't, also don't want to go too much into details of that, but this is just a measure if you take a, take a population of agents and you look at their payouts uh, between them, you can, uh, you can measure kind of how much cyclicity is there, how much... Uh, so the population of agents can be such that one agent just dominates everyone and wins all the games against them. And there's, if you want to pick the best agents, you clearly have one and that's it. Or it could be such that actually there is never, you can never pick the best agent. Like if you pick rock, then the scissors will beat you, but uh, sorry, you, but you'll, you'll beat the scissors, but the paper will beat you and so on. Uh, and that's kind of the measure of the cyclicity in the population. And what we found is that Opry has a much higher cyclicity in its population, sort of effective diversity. And that might be another reason for its good generalization is that it, inside its population when it trains, because of its hierarchical structure, it manages to generate more diverse set of policies. And uh, through that, it kind of generalizes better as well. Um, so then we looked at what strategies actually did Opry learn. So we have this hierarchical structure and what do different uh, parts of that hierarchy correspond to. And this, is, uh, this work was done by my intern, Maria Eckstein. Uh, she's in Berkeley and she's doing neuroscience. And so she wanted to kind of look at the agents as if they were kind of experimental test subjects and kind of tease apart what exactly are they doing. Uh, so this is um, this is the plot uh, that I like. Okay, let me just uh, let me explain what this plot is going for. So um, here. <clears throat> We have a, we took an agent that we trained directly to exploit the bots. Uh, the rock, paper, and scissors. It was kind of an easy experiment to see what's going on. Uh, what you see in this plot, um, every bar corresponds to a time step, and every color corresponds to a, a weight of a particular option in the vector, in the weight vector, in the uh, in the p, uh, p of z. And uh, sort of as we go, this distribution changes. And we're kind of inspecting what's happening at every slice. You can see that when it starts off, the distribution of our options is pretty random, like in a sense, pretty entropic. So it didn't really settle on anything yet. And what the Opry agent, which is blue, does, it just kind of like hads left across the screen uh, to see what's going on. And then what happens next is that somewhere around here, around the step 24, uh, it, it sees the bot and it also sees that all the um, uh, the rocks are gone. All the purple stuff like the rock here is gone. And what happens at that point is that the option distribution changes radically. Suddenly the evidence for what's going on has changed and so does change its policy. It just dashes across to pick up all the counters uh, all the paper, and then once it has the paper, it just goes and attacks the bot. So this is just was for us a sanity check uh, to see that uh, that the options actually correspond to something meaningful. Then we sort of uh, went uh, to. See, I mean, this is all good that this is how it works uh, for representation, but we wanted to verify that options are causal to the behavior because. In the previous experiment, we cannot really quite say whether this is just, okay, just condense some representation somewhere in its neurons, but we don't really know if we change that representation that the agent will behave differently. Maybe the high-level policy is meaningless and all the policies underneath are the same, so however you mix them doesn't matter. Uh, we wanted to see that they're causal. If I change those activations, I will actually get an effect. It's like kind of electrocuting different neurons in the subject and seeing that they, they actually execute a behavior. We also wanted to investigate the coverage of the strategy space. So if we invest it, like kind of 
activate those different options? Do we do we get a reasonable cover of this uh, of, of this game? So the way we did it is we kind of we said, okay, so every option now will be a separate agent. We'll just take an agent. We'll activate one of its options by just setting it to kind of like a one hot distribution. We'll treat it as a separate agent and we'll run an option for uh, several episodes against every bot and measure certain statistics like does it scout, does it observe the opponent, does it tag, uh, how aggressive it is, it's like does it tag, how short is the episode, and what resources it collects. So it's kind of like to have a broad picture of what's going on um, with the agent, uh, given different options and given different bots, right? Because it's also another another conditioning for the behaviors who it's playing against. So okay, cool. So what am I presenting here in this uh, in this plot? So every plate um, is a, is an experiment. Uh, sorry. Every plate is an option, is a, an experiment with activating one of the options. Uh, so every row is either against a paper, against a rock, against a scissor bot, and every column is a different stats, like episode length, tagging, how much does it shoot uh, and hit, uh, what reward does it get, how many resources it collected, and how much does it see the opponent. And we can see that certain kind of clear patterns emerge. For example, these options are clearly about picking paper. These options are clearly about tagging. These options are clearly about spying on the opponent. And a lot of them are also quite mixed, right? So this is like pick paper and observe the opponent a lot. Uh, so options are like what we can confirm, kind of conclude from that is the nice thing is that the options are both causal and meaningful. Like they do actually correspond to different behaviors and this behavior has mean something in the game, and they kind of meaningfully cover most of what's going on in the game. Uh, the next question is kind of, okay, so we, we did it on this toy environment. Uh, it's cool, it works, but does it scale to something more? And like in this particular example, we'll try more players, more space, more time, and slightly more complex rules. So this is kind of, for now, it's just a scaled up version of the same game. But now we have five agents instead of one. The episode does not terminate if they shoot each other. You just uh, distribute the rewards, and then uh, the loser gets uh, frozen for a few for 50 steps, and then it can play again. And the episode is really long. It's like a 1,000 step or something like that. Um, and the resources also respawn. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a much much bigger thing, right? So there's a lot more going on. Uh, and they kind of like run around and they shoot each other. And you kind of, it's it's also a harder problem because you cannot just buy a few resources missing. You cannot figure out who picked them up. So you have to actually observe what the others are doing um, and so on. So let's see how kind of our agents perform here. And uh, so again, we see that, so what do we have here? We have on top is the individual return uh and on the bottom we have victories and on the left sorry it's not uh, it's not signed but on the left we have training and on the right we have test so uh, how much it kind of how well it performs in training how much well this performs in test and then in uh sorry trained by training i mean if you just exploit the bots like i'll give you the bots we pre-train specialists some that pick prefer picking rock, prefer picking paper, prefer picking scissors. Uh, and on the left is just like, what if I just train directly against them? Uh, and on the other is like, what if I uh, train and self-play and then generalize to them? OK, cool. So we see that, again, sort of uh, there's a pretty good, oh, so, sorry, guys. I've, it's been a while since I've given a presentation on the right is um uh let me see so okay let's just go one by one this plot over here is individual return of generalize generalizing to the unseen opponents after self-play and on the right this is the training curve this is like if i directly exploit them in the training cool uh <clears throat> 
we can see that sort of like Opry's are generally doing better in both cases, but we can see also something else. We see that in training, they can get up to like 60 return against the, uh, the fixed boss and it keeps climbing. While here we got only to four and it's like, wow, okay. So we're sort of generalizing, but we're generalizing very poorly. Isn't even, is this even signal at all? Is this even anything going on or is it just nonsense? And, uh, but here what we did, we measured uh, actually the amount of victories uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, the agents have in their interactions. So essentially, you, when you play out your inventories, you get the reward. It's kind of proportional to buy how much you win. So like if I have 90% paper and I play against the guy who has 90% scissors, I lose a lot. But if I have just like slightly bit more paper when he has slightly bit more scissors, I lose by little. But still there is always like one loses, one wins. And we can now plot the amount of like loses and wins, uh, losses and, and victories. And we see that actually like this, this time it's a little bit, uh, it's regretfully on the other side, but this uh, plot on the bottom left is uh, the amount of victories if we train directly against the bots. And we see that it's kind of like slowly climbing to seven. And if we're uh, plotting the amount of victories against the bots, if we're generalizing from self-play, see that we actually reach the same numbers quite fast. So what happens is that since um, all the agents are playing in self-play and uh, the, what they learn, what Opry learns is to be very cautious and win a lot of battles, but by a small margin because it can't quite know what the others are doing and it expects the others are to do what they are doing and what they are doing is being cautious and win by a small bit. So what usually happens is that kind of observes the others and if it sees you picking up two rocks in the in um, in a row and it has some paper, it will just attack. So you always win interactions by a small margin. Yeah, uh, Vadim. Yeah, I have a sort of a rhetorical question. Can you even compare uh, the two scenarios, like the numbers, uh, given that one scenario measures your actual, the, the agent's actual skill of playing the game, and another scenario is overfitting to these particular opponents. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a very valid point. Uh, it's a very valid point. I think that is, that is, that is kind of true what she's saying. I think what, what I'm kind of trying to do here, maybe on a slightly kind of like a slight of hand, way I'm trying to kind of relate it a bit to test train and supervised learning scenario and trying to be able to argue about some things like overfitting and it is a bit different because it's a different like kind of I train one model to just exploit and the other one is really trying to get the gain but I think it's still instructive to look at how far can you go if I give you the set to exploit and how that compares to if I give you the exploration task as well and how do you generalize. But it's a very good point. Any more questions? Cool, I'll keep going. So, okay, and this is a little bit of a new content. So it's like, okay, fine, I mean, but does it really scale? Like, like this was yet another version of running with scissors just a bit larger with a bit more player school it's a bit more complicated of course but like does it really work so this is a um a pretty fresh thing called melting pot which was uh, done with uh, these wonderful courses from uh deepmind and google and we're uh, we're releasing it quite soon uh <clears throat> so the idea here is we made a hell a uh, hell a ton of scenarios to test our agents so we created, uh, I think, like about a dozen different environments. They all kind of this little pixels running around. But there's are many games that test, uh, like it's a social dilemma, or is it resource management? Uh, do you need to learn reciprocity? Are there uh, other co cooperative competitive? There's King of the Hill. There's Capture the Flag. There's um, like cleaning the river and eating apples. There's different versions of social dilemmas. There's even overcooked uh like small overcooked inspired game and for all of these environments we what we did is we came up with it we made a generalization protocol where essentially we do training and self play and then we have a held out test agents or what we call community of bots 
with whom we kind of like we use for testing so we take the population of Eurasians that you train we maybe will replace some of them with bots see what happens or maybe we take a bot population and replace one of their agents with only one from your population see what happens and so on and so forth so it's kind of like we have the physical bit which is we call substrate and we have about like 12 of them and then we have communities which are these pre-trained bots that exhibit different behaviors like in this in case of running with scissors this were rock paper and scissors specialist but in different other games there are different like in like something like cleaning the river game it's those that clean the river those that eat the apples and so on and we now have a lot of test scenarios so we have about 90 different test scenarios which is a which are different different agents you can work with uh, that, that are testing your, your your population of agents and sort of the way we construct those test bots is why we come up we usually come up with some specific pseudo rewards like in case of running with scissors this was uh like pick up rock pick up paper pick up scissors then we train a lot of them then we do some quality control figuring out that the boss actually learned these interesting behaviors and then we kind of compose them into this background communities against which we can test and we get a lot of a lot of data to play with so i will not bore you with going through this huge matrix of results uh, and it will soon 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 will all be public and you can be able to check it out but the uh, the good news is that opera still performs well on all of these tasks and even though it was formulated for kind of two like uh, competitive zero sum with concealed information kind of game it still performs well also on a cooperative and collaborative games where it seems just kind of being able to reason about what's going on in the opponent is quite helpful. Uh, cool. So I'm actually uh, ready to conclude. So yeah, this is a this is a work like what I've showed you is the hierarchical agent for Myro. I hope that was quite interesting for you, and uh, it generalizes, learns meaningful options and scales. There's more ablations and more baselines in the paper, and the melting pot paper is coming out soon. Uh, I think if there is kind of like one thing I want you to take away from this talk is that generalization is important and generalization and reinforcement learning is under addressed and we should always look at generalization and measure that and that should like we should move as a field towards it and that in multi-agent measuring generalization is actually kind of easier than it is in uh, in single agent case because you can just vary opponents and while well, you get different problem it's a bit more straightforward um and uh i feel that's kind of a way to address generalization and also to get some generality out of our agents and yeah thanks for your attention thank you it's, it was a very interesting talk i didn't i, I didn't look at some multi-agent uh, rl this way before does anyone else? Uh, I will ask my questions after, <laughs> after others. <laughs> so that I'm. But if others don't have any, uh, I, I'm interested. How did you like uh, the interesting? Uh, I'm by no means am I an expert in hierarchical RL, uh, uh -huh. but. Uh, your uh, approach seems to seems to differ from a lot of hierarchical RL by the fact that you hide the latest observation from uh, the option, right? Uh, or or don't you? No, no, you you. No. you, you uh, it's it, it's less than or equal. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I thought, yeah. Now, I think the main the main difference from kind of classic hierarchical RL is how we train the policy over options, right? And that's the biggest kind of um, quest in the hierarchical RL. It's like if I know my options, I can train a great policy over them. Or if I know my policy over options, I can probably train my options. But like, how do I kind of like get them to learn together? And here, the idea of using concealed information, like the hindsight, something that I can use later. Uh, to do that is, I think, the main the main trick. Yeah, interesting. Also, very interesting to see the actually the options that result and that you can interpret them. It's... Yeah. Okay. I got it. Yeah. Then I don't think I have uh, any more questions. Thank you once again. Uh, I'm if... sorry. 
I have a question. To, uh, could you please explain why uh, it is easier to uh, measure generalization um, easier in a multi-agent setting? Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, so how did how to measure generalization in, in single agent tarot, right? You gotta come up with a task that is a little bit different from your original task, but not too different, right? And there's no, because I mean you can't ex, uh, you can't expect an agent to play uh, so sort of I don't know to cook well when it was trained to sweep the floors. So there's always this trade of like, how do we come up with tasks that are a little bit different? In supervised learning, it's a bit easier because we have all these IID assumptions and everything like that. And I can just get a lot of image net data and then I just sample half away and here's your test set and we can measure how well you generalize. In single agent RL, it's a bit harder. It's a lot of manual task design. And the question is what constitutes a separate task is often like, well, it is different enough so that reviewers will accept that it's a different task, but it's not too different so that my agent can actually can actually do it. And there are a lot of tests in, uh, like there have been a lot of papers for single agent RL showing that our methods are actually really bad at generalizing. Like you teach an agent to jump over a box and like kind of a 2D scroll again, then you move a box by two pixels and it bumps into it uh, and so on. Why is it easy in multi-agent RL is because other agents are part of the environment uh, for you. So to change the environment, all you have to do is to change other agents. And we're a lot better at training, at least I am, I'm a lot better at training other agents than at designing and modifying environments. So if I can just train a bunch of different agents and then uh, not show them to you due to your agent during training and then compare against, I kind of always measuring generalization. Um, I think when I say easier, I mean really the practical kind of researcher effort type of thing. It's like, I only need to now, I know how to do machine learning well, I know how to do reinforcement learning well, now I can use reinforcement learning to generate more problems for my reinforcement learning. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. It's it's interesting that uh, like a month ago we had here Joel Lehman uh, from Uber AI with Poet. Uh, if you've heard of it, uh, paired open-ended trailblazers, and uh, he uh, was addressing the same idea that we need uh, environments that can be flexible and that can be changed so that we can train agents that generalize. Uh, but his uh, his I think his is sort of. Uh, the state of the art single agent approach to that, uh, their algorithm. So uh, it would be interesting if, like, we have uh, apples to apples comparison between uh, well, your approach and that yeah. approach. I think, I mean, like, this is more of a philosophical bit that I, like, I said right now. I don't, I didn't like show much towards it. And I think, like, the melting pot paper that's going to come out will kind of explain a bit more. But uh, I think it's actually complementary. I think we should do both. I mean, obviously. Uh, I'm kind of like overselling multi-agent because this is what kind of I want to bring across. But I think having generative environments in a non-trivial sense is also very important. Having kind of like like kind of rich uh, um, environments where we can measure generalization even without multi-agent is also really important. For some problems are not multi-agent, we still want to solve them and we still want to generalize. And but I think it's kind of like bringing the two together will be really powerful. Um, what I'm thinking about too. Probably th there might be some hybrid approach waiting to happen here. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please explain again uh, melting pot your, uh, testing set? Uh, did you test? Uh, each environment uh, separately, or you just uh, trained on all of them and then uh, tested different scenarios? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we we took it environment by environment. So uh, you train one agent and for one environment in population play, and then you have a bunch of scenarios and you test against it. You take another environment to do that in parallel. In principle, you could have like one agent to rule them all approach. 
But right now, we we're just more aiming towards like establishing the data set, like the, the problems, and kind of if you train an agent that solves them all, uh, you could still run it for the test protocol. That will work. That's fine. Um, but we did not do that. So you, you didn't try to test uh, a generalization between uh, no no we, we did. inter environment set. No, we haven't done that yet. It's but it's like well, environment wise and like test protocol wise, it's all it's all good. You could do that. Cool. Anyone else? I think we, it's just exactly two hours. Yeah. Uh, I don't mind staying for a little longer, but looks like we've been <laughs> precise. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take another question if there is one. Cool. Well, it was really nice, uh, nice meeting you folks. Uh, uh, all the best, and hope your 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 COVID lockdowns are are are, are all right, and uh, hopefully see you once all the conferences restart in real life. Also, feel free to drop by for our next seminars. Uh, we're sure, them bi-weekly. Cool. Yeah, um, add me to the mailing list or whatever is your um, your announcement system. Uh, we have a Gitter chat. Uh, we you also uh, on the website uh, there is an add to calendar button that now works. Uh, I fixed it <laughs> recently. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can use either uh, announcements will be uh, published. Awesome. Cool. See you okay. uh, then see you next time, I guess. Uh, at least some of you. <laughs> see some of you next time. All right. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.